tonight. Still hanging on. Israel's pursuit of Palestine continues, but Biden remains hopeful on reaching consensus. Just how much longer will a ceasefire deal take to come into fruition? Find out tonight. Choppy waters. Taiwan warns China of breaching its frontline borders as tensions mount between the two nations. Welcome to the club. Sweden clears its final hurdles in joining NATO, leaving behind its 200-year legacy of neutrality and non-aligned styles. And Ram on the run. It's all in a day's work as police chase down a fluffy criminal that is fleeing from authorities. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening. You're tuning in to World News Tonight this Tuesday Eve. Great to be a part of your evening. As always, we have for you a plethora of key updates to stories we have kept you updated on throughout the past few weeks. And today as well, we begin with the Israel-Palestine conflict. The talks continue as President Joe Biden said that he hopes there'll be a ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas conflict by next Monday. But many believe that the deadline is far too idealistic as humanitarian aid runs out in the region. But Israel refuses to step on the brakes for the onslaught, causing key upsets in government infrastructure as well. Israel's military says it has uncovered another underground network of what it calls terror tunnels connecting the north and south of the Gaza Strip. One of the main objectives of the Israeli offensive has been to destroy the networks, which the IDF says are used by Hamas to move fighters, weapons and supplies throughout the territory. With Israel maintaining its position on an imminent invasion of Rafah in pursuit of Hamas fighters, the Palestine Red Crescent of society has in the meantime successfully evacuated 24 people from the overwhelmed Al-Amal hospital in nearby Khan Yunis. Israel's military has finally presented the war cabinet with a plan for evacuating the population from areas of fighting, despite international calls for it to cancel the operation. On the political front, Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammed Shatia has resigned along with his government, which runs parts of the occupied West Bank. President Mahmoud Abbas has accepted his decision. Shatia's resignation signals a willingness by the Western-backed Palestinian leadership to accept reforms as it wants to take over the running of Gaza from its rival Hamas once the war is over. And from that conflict, we move on to the next. With Russia and Ukraine entering a third year of war, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said his military has only received 30% of the artillery shells promised by the EU. Meanwhile, Ukraine's defense ministry says that some 410,000 Russian troops have lost their lives since the invasion in February of 2022. Marking the second anniversary since the Russian invasion of Ukraine over the weekend, President Vladimir Zelensky called for continued support from the West in order to push back ongoing Russian offensives. However, the Ukrainian president on Monday also said that his military had not received all of the support it was promised, including one million artillery shells promised by the EU. He says the Ukrainian military has only received 30 percent of the promised amount, with the EU noting that the production capacity of defense companies in each country has not been able to keep pace, while their own arsenals have been depleted. High representative of the EU for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Joseph Borrell, recently admitted that the supply is being delayed, adding that 524,000 rounds would be delivered by the end of March. The prolonged war seems to have taken a toll on Ukraine as it struggles to defend against the Russian offensive. According to the Associated Press, the Ukrainian military once again withdrew its troops from Ariuka following an attempt to take back the Eastern Front region. The strategically important town of Ariuka was recently captured by the Russian army. The military spokesman said its troops had to retreat further as they could not overcome the vastly larger number of Russians. Meanwhile, the Russian military claimed that it had destroyed an M1 Abrams tank for the first time. The main battle tank was given to Ukraine by the U.S. and deployed to the front line last fall. 
And a day after President Zelensky announced the number of Ukrainian troops that have died in battle, Ukraine's defense ministry says 417,000 Russian troops were killed during the two-year war. It added that Russia lost many of its military vehicles, including 6,555 tanks, 12,478 combat armored vehicles, 25 battleships, one submarine, and 340 military aircraft. The latest Russian troops loss figure announced by Kyiv is higher than the number predicted by the West, where reports have put the number at around 300,000. And the tensions continue in our region as well as five Chinese Coast Guard ships entered prohibited or restricted waters around Taiwan's frontline islands of Kinmen, but left shortly after being warned away. A Taiwan minister announced this amid a continued rise in tensions with Beijing. China's Coast Guard this month began regular patrols around Taiwan-controlled Kinmen Islands, which are close to China's coast, after two Chinese nationals died trying to flee Taiwan's Coast Guard after their boat entered prohibited waters. Kwam Bin Ling, head of Taiwan's Oceans Affairs Council, which runs the Coast Guard, told reporters at the parliament that the Chinese boats left the area shortly after Taiwan's Coast Guard told them to leave. Taiwan's defense ministry said last week it is not bolstering its forces on the islands close to China. Taiwan's defense minister, also speaking at the parliament, said today that he hoped what was happening around Kinmen would not escalate and would be handled smoothly. China's Coast Guard, which has no publicly available contact details, has yet to come in. China recognizes no sovereignty claims by Taiwan and has accused Taiwan of acting maliciously by causing the deaths of two Chinese nationals on the fishing boat, which had gotten too close to one of the Kingmen's heavily fortified isles. Still in the region, several farmer unions in India continued their agitation against the Indian government, with the Samyukta Kisa Morka observing a quit WTO day. During this event, farmers parked their tractors in the left lane on major national highways without obstructing the flow of traffic. Farmers in Punjab and Haryana states are demanding that the agriculture sector would exclude from the World Trade Organization agreement. The WTO mandates all member nations to offer price guarantees to farmers beyond a certain limit to maintain a supply-demand balance. The agitation by farmers comes as WTO's 13th ministerial conference began on yesterday in Abu Dhabi. Ministers from across the world will attend the four-day meeting to review the WTO's multilateral trading system as well as to decide the organization's agenda. Meanwhile, traffic congestions were reported in multiple areas in Uttar Pradesh state as farmers parked their vehicles on the left lane on the roads. The BKU led this protest in solidarity with the farmers from Pajab and Haryana. Rakesh Tikhet, a prominent figure in BKU, stated that the tractor march aims to compel the Narendra Modi government to address the grievances of farmers. The farmers' lament continues to ripple across the globe as farmers from all over Europe marched into Brussels to protest against a varied range of issues including low prices for their products, environmental regulation and free trade deals. The anger of Europe's farmers continues unbated. Tires and hoses burned, straw and tear gas thrown, nearly a thousand tractors and even more farmers gathered in Brussels' European quarter on Monday. The Belgian, French, Italian and Dutch producers and breeders are calling for an end to international free trade agreements and regulation of the European market. Agricultural protests continue despite announcements made by the European Commission. Last month, it proposed granting an exception from the set-aside obligation. It also proposed to review the rules for products from outside the European Union. Yet, this was insufficient for the protesters. This demonstration is taking place on the sidelines of a meeting of the 27 agriculture ministers who are currently looking for ways to reduce the administrative burdens deemed too numerous and restrictive by farmers. Still in Europe now, we saw history being made as Hungary's parliament approved Sweden's NATO accession, clearing the last hurdle before the historic step by the Nordic country, whose neutrality lasted through two world wars and the simmering conflict of the Cold War. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban addressed parliament before the crucial vote, stating that the Swedish-Hungarian military cooperation and Sweden's accession to NATO will strengthen Hungary's security. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent Zahan Nabe Gunavardhan from Helsinki in Finland for more. Sahan. 
Yes, Anradi, Stockholm abandoned its non-alignment policy for greater safety within the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022. Turkey withheld ratification on Sweden membership demanding tougher action against militants from the PKK which is said had made a home in Sweden. Sweden changed its laws and relaxed rules over arms sales to assault Turkey. Budapest mostly vented its annoyance over Swedish criticism of the direction of democratic development under rationalist Prime Minister Orban rather than making any concrete demands. The ascension of Sweden and Finland is the most significant expansion of the alliance since its move into Eastern Europe in the 1990s. Sweden will bring resources such as cutting-edge submarine tailored to Baltic Sea conditions and sizable fleet of domestically produced Gripen fighter jets into the alliance. It is hiking military spending and should reach NATO's threshold of 2% of GDP this year. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Sahana Begunavardar from Helsinki in Finland. Let's go in for a short commercial break. We'll be right back with more key stories. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back. We have some updates for you on Trump's legal troubles tonight as prosecutors are seeking a gag order for former U.S. President Donald Trump in his upcoming New York trial involving hush money paid to the porn star Stormy Daniels. Noting Trump's, quote, long-standing history of attacking witnesses, investigators, prosecutors, judges, and others involved in legal proceedings against him, the office of Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg has asked a judge to restrict Trump from making public comments about witnesses or exposing the identities of jurors. Bragg's office also asked that Trump be barred from commenting on prosecutors on the case, other than Bragg himself, as well as court staff members. A spokesperson for Trump's campaign said a gag order in the case would infringe on Trump's right to free speech if implemented. Trump is accused of falsifying business records to cover his lawyer Michael Cohen's $130,000 payment to Stormy Daniels shortly before the 2016 election to keep her silent about a sexual encounter she said she had with Trump a decade earlier. Hi, everyone. He has denied any such relationship. Trump, who is cruising toward the Republican nomination to challenge Democratic President Joe Biden in November, is scheduled to go on trial in state court in Manhattan starting on March 25th. It's one of four criminal cases against him. He has pleaded not guilty. And on the road to the White House tonight, with Super Tuesday looming and the Michigan primaries underway, Nikki Haley really has to pick up the pace if she is to have any shot at a presidential bid. Supporters of Nikki Haley gathered to hear her speak at the Detroit Marriott in Troy, but some believe the 11th hour efforts may be too little too late. Well, for analysis on the situation, we have other than a world news special correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. Shanali, what are you seeing on the ground at the moment? And rather, I think it's pretty clear why the political spotlight is currently on Michigan, where voters are casting their primary ballots. And then again, four days later, when Republicans host an additional contest. The party adopted a novel but somewhat confusing hybrid nominating system this year, which will culminate on the 2nd of March with a statewide nominating convention. Both parties also have an option to vote for uncommitted. Polling shows that Trump and Biden has major leads in the state, which could help speed up things, but after polls close. And while Trump's strong standing applies to convention as well, there's greater uncertainty about the timing of the results because of how novel the process is. Haley acknowledged after losing by about 20 points in South Carolina that 40% of the vote is not necessary 50% or more. She needs to append the Republican presidential primary. But as she also noted, four out of 10 is no tiny group and there are huge numbers of voters in the Republican primaries who are saying that they want an alternative to Trump. Whether it's a huge number or simply a well-funded but effectively defeated minority is the question going forward. So far, it appears to be 
the latter. But an expectations definition performance by Haley in Michigan could nudge the narrative back in her direction ahead of Super Tuesday on 5th of March. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. Well, we're back in Asia now as Southeast Asia's largest and longest running multinational annual military exercise officially commenced in Eastern Thailand. This year's Cobra Gold exercise will see over 9,000 troops from 30 countries participating in the drills, which will last until March 8th, according to an official press release. This year will also see participation by a delegation from the Chinese military in the humanitarian aid exercise portion. This is according to China's Defense Ministry. Cobra Gold was launched in 1982 and is a war games event that serves as a key platform for the US to show up alliances in Asia. And still in the region, Japan is set to release yet more of Fukushima's treated wastewater in what would be its fourth such round. The opposition still remains loud and clear. However, so far there has not been any reports of adverse effects due to the release. Japan is reportedly set to begin round four of its wastewater release from the Fukushima nuclear power plant on Wednesday. According to Gyodo News on Monday, Japan's Tokyo Electric Power Company will discharge about 7,800 tons of contaminated water over 17 days. Japan has disposed of approximately 23,000 tons of wastewater since the first release began in August last year. It plans to further release around 54,000 tons between this April and March 2025. The Japanese government has been guaranteeing the safety of the water release despite backlash from neighboring countries. An update on the Odysseus spacecraft now as shares in intuitive machines have unfortunately plummeted more than 30% after the space exploration company said its Odysseus moon lander had tipped over. Last week, Intuitive became the first private company to land on the moon and the first from the U.S. since 1972. Shares had skyrocketed the day after the landing. But investors weren't over the moon with news that the payload had tipped over and was resting on its side. The Texas-based company said all but one of its six NASA science and technology payloads were facing upwards and receptive to communications and are expected to carry out their objectives. Intuitive stock fell as much as 35 percent in morning trading Monday, more than offsetting last week's gains when nearly 99 million shares were traded. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. A groundbreaking study that tested an asthma medication showed that it could be used to treat exposure to multiple food allergies, including nuts. The study found that many patients who were injected with the drug were now able to eat some of these foods. Liam Wong is one of more than two million children who are suffering from multiple food allergies in the U.S. After breaking out in hives as a baby, his parents discovered he was allergic to multiple foods, including nuts and eggs. <laughs> for Liam, just one peanut could mean a trip to the emergency room for anaphylactic shock. That's why Liam's parents jumped at the chance to join a groundbreaking study. Stanford researchers wanted to see if the drug Zolaire, normally prescribed for asthma, could also help with accidental exposures to multiple food allergens, including nuts. While the drug doesn't eliminate the allergy, it reduces allergic reactions. The large-scale study found that two-thirds of patients who were injected with Zolaire were able to eat two-and-a-half peanuts without having a severe allergic response, like trouble breathing. This is a huge game changer for our patients. Dr. Chintaraja hopes the new FDA approval will make it more accessible and affordable to her patients. For Liam's parents, it's life changing. A newfound freedom for Liam and potentially life saving option for families. And finally tonight, here's an interesting story. There is a ram on the run, literally. A certain fluffy guy has his moment in the spotlight as a police chase ensures to try and wrangle the fellow back home. Problem is, whose ram is it 
and why was it out on an adventure? Take a look. Gotcha! It was an interesting police call, but no less exciting to say the least. Let me over them. A ram was on the loose in a suburban New Jersey town, and Mount Laurel police were called to collect it. There it was in the backyard. Now authorities are asking for the public's help. They want to know whose ram this is. If you happen to be missing your ram, give the Mount Laurel PD a call. All in a day's work. Well, clearly he wanted to ram right through the fence in those last few moments. Well, that's all the stories we have for you tonight. We'll see you again next time with more updates on the happenings of the world. Have a good night.